Don't Diss My Ability is made possible through the generous support of Full Circle Community Thrift Store, helping individuals or families living with cancer. Our goal is to help alleviate the stresses of daily financial obligations during this time by providing financial assistance to those in need. Full Circle Community Thrift Store. Living Innovations. Providing support for people with developmental disabilities to have a good life at home and in the community. Services include community connections, which facilitates employment, skill development, and community integration to maximize each individual's well-being and independence. For more information or to learn about job opportunities for compassionate people wishing to do meaningful work, visit livinginnovations.com. Natural Care Wellness Center has been serving the New Hampshire and Maine seacoast for 18 years. Our goal is to encourage a healthy lifestyle through education, wellness choices, and hands-on healing. Natural Care Wellness Center, offering gentle force chiropractic, family and child wellness, chiropractic acupuncture, holistic nutrition, nutrition response testing, a decompression table, therapeutic exercise, whole food supplements, neuro-emotional techniques, and massage therapy. And by One Sky Community Services. For over 30 years, One Sky has taken great pride in overcaring for those with developmental disabilities and acquired brain disorders. Dedicated to every individual it serves, giving them full comprehensive support and services essential to fulfilling the personal and professional potential and becoming a successful member of their community. Serving 24 Seacoast communities, call 603-436-6111 for further information. And by TMS Architects. New England Design Redefined. Hi, I'm Red Grammar, and you're listening to Don't Diss My Ability. My song, City Beautiful, is for you. Because we really do believe that you are beautiful. Hello, my name is Dr. David Rutstein. I'm delighted to... Um, be here to talk about the wonderful new television show Don't Diss My Ability. You know that show um, speaks very credibly to the real-life situations that face uh, people with disabilities and um, uh, really tries to encourage the audience to understand what disabilities are about and how people can lead normal and productive and vibrant lives. As a public health expert, you know, I used to be the Deputy Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, I understand the value of ensuring people remain healthy and vital uh, to um, what they do and the families they serve and the communities in which they live. Don't Diss My Ability uh, speaks very directly to this and I'm delighted that this television show uh, is gaining in popularity, having a wider and wider audience, and uh, is helping people throughout the seacoast and perhaps the nation to um, better understand what it means to live with disabilities. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Don't Diss My Ability. I'm Ronnie Tomanio, and I'm joined uh, by several wonderful friends. Pamela mm -hmm. Sollenberger? Mm -hmm. You want well, to say your name? Pamela Sollenberger. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Uh, and uh, to my far right is... Are you going to say your name? I'm, I thought you were going to do that. Well, I, I don't know. I change it up. <laughs> okay. Next time I'll say your name, this time I'm asking you to say your name. Okay. I'm Lee Harvey. Mm. And our old friend and our guest today, the hot seat, is John Lovering. Yes, yes. I am John Lovering. I'm the old friend. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> <coughs> and this is kind of a, an emotional uh, show for us because uh, John and Lee and Pamela and myself were on for seven years, was it, John? Yes. Yeah, we yeah, were on uh, radio years. together uh, down the street for seven years. and. Um, I haven't seen John since we left radio, and then another added bonus is that Sean, who was filming some of our shows over there, a good friend, uh, is also back filming uh, 
uh, again. So it's like uh, old home week. The whole crew is back. So it uh, means a lot to us. So we're taking over here, huh? <laughs> There's quite a bit of us. Here. Okay. Uh, um, what I want to start with is that uh, this is, has such an unlikely beginning. I have no training at this, which is probably evident. And uh, the start of it is that at, at the radio show down the street is that I was just with a client. I work with people with disabilities. Um, thus the name of the show, Don't Dis My Ability. And I was just uh, curious about this radio station. My wife had gone into it. Uh, and she said, you ought to check that out, Ronnie. And I was just curious, so I didn't know we had a radio station in Portsmouth. So I went in with my client. Uh, and I, at that time, there was a station manager there. And I, I asked him, uh, what do you do here? And he told me all about community radio. I, I was really on. That was an unknown uh, concept to me that, you know, I, like most of us, I turn on the radio to hear music, but I wasn't, didn't know about community radio, about all the things it does, like community television, uh, the wide spectrum of shows you could have. And I was fascinated by it. And then I was looking at his program list, it was on the wall. And it, there was no, and I said, you know, there's no shows for people with disabilities. And he said, if you're willing to go through uh, the training uh, for eight weeks, we'll, su we'll supply you with a trainer. And if the show is acceptable, uh, then uh, you could have your own show. And I said, well, this seems like fun. I, I never dreamed anybody would give us a show. I mean, <laughs> To me right now, that doesn't, that seems so improbable, but I figure it's not a bad way to spend an hour or so. Uh, it's a good thing. Why not? And uh, so our trainer was John Lovering. And John, what did you think when we walked in the door and you realized that uh, we were your uh, Well, I said, this is, this is going to be a challenge. <laughs> uh, I, I knew that, but I also knew that uh, I had three very determined uh, people because anyone who would come to the station and frankly uh, had some of the disabilities that the group had had to have a lot of courage mm -hmm. and I thought they deserve a good crack at uh, getting, a, getting a program. Yeah so. and uh, so we started and it was an eight-week training and it was me and John was there anybody else or was, was it Allie? Allie came a little bit later but uh, pretty quickly yeah Allie Ketchum. Yeah. yeah a young lady with a severe disability. Uh, and uh, I've actually contacted her. And she might be a future guest, so you know. And uh, so we started. And uh, I mean, there's this control board. There's a huge control board there. And it was befuddling to me. And uh, my client, who I work with, uh, he, uh, he, he was a little bit better technically than me. but. Really, we really didn't have the skill set for this, neither one of us. And we had to produce uh, a uh, pilot show. And that had to go before, was it a board? The programming committee. A yeah. programming committee. And uh, so we, we went through this, and uh, we produced this show. And we made every mistake in the book. We didn't repress the wrong buttons. One time. Uh, the young man who was at the at the control board didn't have the volume on. Or we, we did everything that you could possibly do to not have a show. And and we got this finished product. And what happened when you took it to the board? Well, first of all, I should uh, mention that this was after like 30 hours of training. Right. And uh, when the there was no improvement, right? Uh, well, there was no measurable improvement. You managed to get into the station and get into the chairs. We parked the car. We didn't hit any cars. <laughs> we came in. We parked. Nobody was hurt. We didn't run That's anybody over anybody or anything. But but the thing was that um, when you when you recorded your actual pilot show, I could not be in the room. That was part of the programming uh, philosophy that I had to be outside. But I could look through the window and I could see. 
And you were crying. Oh, well, I, I noticed that the recording machine was not started at the very beginning. <laughs> <laughs> and that's like, that's like something you got to have, right? That, that's right. That was that's not problem. optional. You have to actually have to record the so, sound. So I interrupted you. I went in and said, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to, because we wouldn't have had anything. So no. we got that started. And that's then bad I, radio. That's right. <laughs> then I went out and I noticed that the volume control wasn't up. At that time, I, I let it go. I said, well, it was up a little bit, so I was hoping. Anyway, when it was played back, um, the board uh, said to me, they can't do a show. Not with this te technical skills, unless we want to try some more training. Uh, otherwise, the show's not going to happen. So I, I said to them, uh, how about if I was willing to engineer the show? And they said, if you'll be responsible for it, uh, that'd be great. And so I said, I'll do it. And that's how it got started. I had to tell you one thing. At that time, John used to be heavy at one time. I was over 400 pounds. That that's even makes us worse. And so I remember sitting in the back room at a conference table with the, with the what was Bjorn's title? What was that? Uh, he was general manager. He was a general manager. And we're talking about the, the feasibility of this show and what would you do and everything else. <coughs> and you know those modern chairs that they have for dining rooms? Uh, Sean, this is a chair that you shouldn't sit in either. This is a word of caution for you. There's no front to it. Like, you see how this has got legs? Can you get a picture of these legs? There's legs here. Chairs should have four legs, you know. Wouldn't you think? So this chair, this modern chair, it had this metal going down here and nothing in the front. And I'm 400 pounds. And I'm talking and he's asking me questions about what kind of shows would you do and stuff like that. All of a sudden, uh, I realized that Bjorn was getting taller. He was sitting down, but he was, I'm looking like, this, yeah, Bjorn, I can do this. And as he's doing the interview, hey, Bjorn, he says, yeah, okay. And then I'm going, and all of a sudden, the chair collapsed, threw me back against the wall, and I hit my head. And, uh, and that's the start of it. And still they gave us a show. What are you going to do? What, is it, what does an individual have to do to get out of doing a little work? I mean, I did my part. I, was, I sacrificed my body. I crashed my head against the wall. And when I woke up, the next thing I knew, I was on the air with, with a radio show. Yes. And you, you must say that the first show that we did, uh, in the middle of the show, they came in and said, Ronnie, what kind of a vehicle do you have? I don't remember this part. Yes, you, they wanted what kind of a vehicle was Even out when the we were on the live show? Yes, yeah. And, and uh, the issue was that there was an alarm going off in the vehicle, and I didn't know who the vehicle belonged to, and you identified that it was yours. I don't, so, <laughs> I don't remember this. So you got up out of the chair, and you went out. when you went out to the parking lot, before you got to the vehicle, the, uh, the alarm stopped. So you came back in, you sat down, and the alarm started up again, and they came in again, and you went out a second time. And then when you came back in the third time, because it stopped on the second time you got so up. So it stopped, alarm. and then it restarted? It started. Every time you sat down, it restarted. It's because you weighed so much that your side, where your pocket was, had the, uh, your key in it. And every time you sat down, you squeezed against the side of the chair, and it set the alarm off in the car. <laughs> and when you got up, it, it shut it off. So uh, that's what that <laughs> I, knew. I don't remember any of that. I do because I thought, uh oh, we've got a, got a lot of work to do here. It's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that would be the first thing right. is take take your take your thing your keys out of your pocket, right? Yeah, right. Well, oh my oh God! My I didn't even know Christ. that. <laughs> oh, so here's the now. This is fun and games, but. There is really a serious reason for John to be here and why uh, that I didn't understand at the time. Uh, it was more than uh, it was more than he thought we had this great promise. There was some raw talent here. Boy, these guys are going to set the broadcasting world on fire. I mean, John, my, my co-host, he would try to date anybody we had as a guest, anybody. If you were mobile, if you could get on your feet, and you had long hair, you didn't even have to be a woman. You could be a guy with long hair. He's going to ask you, what are you going to do after the show? Oh. And uh, even for me, that was a fair See, you'd be safe, Sean, because you got nothing up top here. 
you, he would not have asked you out. But anybody else, he'd ask you out. And, oh my God, you remember? I'm not I, making that up, no, right? I remember, this is, what was one, this one episode where you had a, uh, a young lady there. I mean, she's probably in her mid-30s, which is very young, right, relatively speaking. And uh, she uh, was, was a counselor, and she was standing by the door, and John went over, and he says, so um, are you married or what? And she said, yes, I am. And so he paused for a minute, and he said, Happily married? He said, yes. Did he, he said, say that? He said, so how's the marriage going? <laughs> And, and I almost fell how out of the chair. How's the marriage going? Yes, how's it going? She said, just fine. I need to pay attention over here. <laughs> <I'm going> like, <laughs> you guys, some of you guys think, well, you're making this up. There's no, not a human being like that in the world. This is absolutely true. That was John. <laughs> he did it every time. <laughs> yeah. So Everywhere. <laughs> so here's the serious part. Um, talk about, now, obviously, it was more, as I say, we didn't have raw talent. You had a personal reason for supporting right. a show that had to do with people with disabilities. Right, right. And I want to start your story and okay. go back and take as much time as you want. All right, well, um, this goes back to 1983, uh, which is what, 33 years ago now. Um, but I, uh, I was a science teacher in a high school down in Massachusetts. And uh, in October of 1983, I. I was working on my car, you know, the time where you used to be able to change your plugs and your points and all that in your car. And I was working in the car and I got this pain in my back up between my shoulder blade. And uh, that was the beginning. I had no idea where that was going to lead to. But anyway, that pain lasted for a couple of weeks. And I finally I went to an uh, osteopath who uh, uh, maneuvered my back and terrible pain when he would push there. And, he said to me, the road to recovery is often rocky, and I made several visits over a period of, well, by this time it was December, December of 1983. Uh, I began to notice that my right leg was getting weak. Every once in a while it would buckle on me, and uh, I was starting to drag my foot. And uh, so I went back to the doctor again, this, this, the osteopath, and he referred me to a, a neurologist. Uh, so I went to a neurologist who checked uh, various numbers of things. Uh, by this time, we'd gotten to January. He was doing some tests. And about the first week in February, uh, that time, it was one Sunday, I went over to the Newington Mall to pick up some, uh, some things at a bookstore. And while I was standing in the bookstore, I picked up a health manual and I looked through it. And it, it had a section on neurological problems. Mm -hmm. And one of them said, um, losing feeling and weakness in the leg can be a sign of something wrong with the spinal cord. Mm -hmm. So I got a little worried about that and uh, decided that uh, I needed to uh, get this thing fully investigated even more than I felt it had been at that point. But before I got a chance to do that, uh, while I was at school, I was coming down the stairs with a bunch of books from one floor to the other to bring to a classroom. And my right leg gave out on me, and I fell down the stairs and landed on the landing, one of the landings. And I couldn't get my leg to move when I, when I tried to get up. It just wouldn't do what I wanted it to do. Um, I had a couple of fellow uh, teachers that helped me, and when they got me up on my feet, I began to get a little bit of movement in it. And uh, I actually drove home, which was a little difficult because I didn't have a whole lot of feeling in my foot. How it was totally numb. How frightening. Yeah, it was. And when I got home, I couldn't get out of the car. I had to toot the horn, and my wife came out. And she had to help me into the house, and I, uh, she got me into the bed. And she said, you're going to the doctor's tomorrow morning. And when the morning came, uh, all during the night, I should mention, my legs started to jump and spasm and kick up in the air. And that morning, I got up, and I went to stand up, and I fell on the floor. I couldn't, I couldn't move the leg again. Mm -hmm. So uh, she got a neighbor, and they got me into the car, and they took me to the emergency room mm -hmm. at, at the local hospital. And that's where it all began. Uh, I was in the hospital, uh, this one hospital, local hospital, for uh, almost three weeks, having all sorts of tests. They really didn't know what was wrong. Uh, it got to the point where they were going to operate on me. Uh, they were going to go into my back. Uh, they, they thought I might have some sort of a growth in the back, but I didn't have, have a, we didn't have um, had CAT scans, but this hospital didn't have one, CAT oh scanner boy. at the time. So uh, 
the surgeon wanted to operate on me, and my wife asked him, this is a good question, too, for people, how many surgeries of this type have you done? Mm -hmm. And he was a relatively young man, but he said three. And she said, uh, I think we need to find somebody that's got a little more experience. Mm -hmm. And my wife, Melanie, advocated for me because I was so sick at that point, um, I had uh, actually signed the paperwork to let him do the surgery. The part that I left out, though, is uh, about a day before I signed that, I went to get out of bed at the hospital. I had a walker, and both of my legs uh, went out, and I fell on the floor, and I couldn't move either leg, and everything from my chest down went numb. I couldn't urinate. I had no, no uh, sensation whatsoever. So uh, I was paraplegic, basically, at that point, and that's when he was going to operate. And uh, I signed the paperwork. I was, so, I was frightened, and I was uh, afraid that uh, this was a whole lot more serious than I had originally thought the day that it started aching when I was working on the car. Anyway, my wife got in touch with a, a neurosurgeon at Leahy Clinic in Burlington, and she talked to him and the, the neurologist uh, in this other hospital um, locally did give me a referral, and they took me by ambulance uh, on a Saturday morning to a Leahy Clinic, and when I got there, this uh, doctor came in, Dr. Charles Fager was his name, and he came in and he examined me and he said, how long has it been since you've moved your legs? And I said, uh, almost two days now. And he, he was, at the time, maybe in his 50s. I was 35. And he came over to me and he put his arm around me and he said, son, I hope I can save your legs. And mm -hmm. I said, what do, what do you mean? He said, it appears to me you've had spinal cord pressure compression <coughs> and uh, nerve endings um, when they compress more than 48 hours can be permanently oh damaged. Boy. So he, uh, it's, this was a Saturday morning, he, he literally pushed the gurney himself down the hallway mm -hmm. and it was like a movie. He was yelling, I need nurses, uh, stat, just like it was a film. And he, he got me into a, a room and they did a myelogram, which is where they inject dye into your spinal column. And there was a fluoroscope, and I could see the dye moving up my back. And when it got to right between my shoulder blades where that pain was, it just stopped. The dye just stopped at that point, and it was an excruciating pain. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he said, there it is. And he took a marker, and he marked my chest, and he marked my back. And the next thing I know, I was flying down the hallway to the, emergency, to the uh, operating room. I woke up, it was six hours later in an uh, in intensive care unit, and I was moved to a, a room on the sixth floor of uh, Leahy Clinic. And my wife was there, and she'd been crying, and my sister was there, she'd been crying, and my father was a uh, basket case. How old were your daughters at the time? Uh, one, let's see, Abe Kim was nine, and Amy was five, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, um, uh, they weren't involved, of course, at this point. I did not know it but the doc at that time, but the doctor had gone back up after the surgery. They removed a tumor that was about the size of a peach that had grown in my lung and had wrapped around my spinal cord, wow. and it had just squeezed as it grew. It squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, and that, that was the reason why I slowly lost feeling and it got weaker and weaker. Um, John, uh, so literally, you were hours away from being totally, permanently paralyzed. Right, right. right. And I was. He hadn't caught this and, and wheeled you in there. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I, he had told my wife that he believed that it was a carcinoma, which uh, he hadn't seen anything like this before in that position. And he said, uh, he gave, told my wife that I had between three to six months to live, as would be his best guess. So there really wasn't any need to do any rehabilitation. No, I didn't find out any of that for about a year. She never so said a word. Not, when uh, your sister and Melanie, your wife, saw you, they had already gotten that news that right. you had three to six months. Right. Ago. But she did not tell me. I didn't know anything about that um, for a long time. About a year later, maybe. Anyway, well, I'll speed this up quite a bit. Take your time, buddy. I was in the lady clinic for two months. Um, I was in the hospital and. About the fifth week, sixth week I was there, um, I was going, they were trying to, uh, first of all, I had all sorts of tests, the cancer had not spread, 
so they felt that they had got it, although I had to have radiation treatment, just to make sure. I had, I had quite a few radiation treatments. And then uh, one, one morning, um, I was laying there in the bed, and every day I'd try to wiggle my toes, and I'd pull the sheet up. And I had these inflatable cuffs on my legs that had to keep the blood flowing so you wouldn't get blood clots in the leg. And I would look at my toe, and I would try to contract it. And this one day, my, thumb, my toe went like that just a little flicker. And I started, I pulled the cord and, and yelled for the nurse. I said, come, I did, I, I moved my toe. And she came in, so let me see. I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, that happened maybe two or three hours later, same thing, couldn't do it. My wife saw it a couple days later, she saw it, and, but I couldn't do it for the doctor or mm -hmm. the nurse. And I found out, finally I did. One day I did do it. Maybe it went on about four or five days before they saw it. But the doctor told me that those nerves are severely damaged and weak, and they're very slowly coming back. Once they fire, they're tired. They have to rest. And uh, oh. it took a while to, for, it to, for them to see it. And when that happened, I, at the same time, the tumor uh, analysis came back, and it term, turned out to be uh, what's called a seminoma cancer, which is cancer of the testicles. And, um, and I told you it was in my lung. Um, it turned out, it, this was written up in the New England Journal of Medicine, in fact, at the time, that apparently when a, when a boy baby is in utero and his mother, um, our testicles begin in our chest cavity. And they mm -hmm. migrate down into the scrotum as we develop mm -hmm. into a, 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 fe you know, a, a baby, a full a term baby. And one cell broke off. In the, and stayed in the lung tissue. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And that's not where testicular cells are supposed to be. It was too warm. So it turned malignant and started to grow. And they had never seen that before, they never seen that presented in the back. Mm -hmm. But the good part of it was that a year before, they had developed a chemotherapy that was highly effective. Uh, it's the same chemotherapy they use today and on ovarian cancer as well. Mm -hmm. and, uh, he said, um, we're going to put you on that, and he said, the uh, radiation melts that tumor like ice cream, and he said, you're going to live to be an old man. Uh, and he said, you may not be walking, but you're going to live to be an old man. So um, the idea was that uh, I had a chance, and they t transferred me to the New England Rehab Center in Woburn, and I was there for another two months. And I was the first cancer patient that they had ever accepted at that hospital um, because they didn't want to spend the money on cancer patients if they were going to die. So they, it was a real mm -hmm. risk, you know, mm -hmm. for them to do it. Um, it's, it's a long, uh, long story, but over a period of, uh, let's see, that was, it took a whole year before I was able to walk again. And uh, I had some incredibly uh, tough moments in that rehab did, center. When did you start going back to school? And, uh, I went teach? back in September of uh, 2000, uh, in 1983. This is, after um, they, this is after they told you that you were going to live to be an old man? Well, yes, um, that I could. I could. But when I went back to school, I went back to school in September of 84, uh, I was in a wheelchair uh, and standing up in a walker for maybe a few minutes, most of the time in a wheelchair. My wife went to school with me. I was a science teacher, so I had to have some help in the classroom. It was tough working with uh, youngsters with Bunsen burners when you're in a wheelchair, because you couldn't move that fast if something mm -hmm. happened. Um, but the, uh, the result was that um, over the period of every, well, at least every week, we were going to physical therapy here in, in uh, Portsmouth. And I was slowly getting to be able to move my legs a little bit better, and I was standing up a little longer in the walkers. Uh, and then I had a CAT scan uh, in November, just, right, just after um, Veterans Day, down at Leahy Clinic. They were just checking to make sure the cancer had not reoccurred anywhere. Is this the part where you're in school and you get a call? Yeah, well, yeah, I had to, yes, I had do to. Do that, do that part where you're teaching in the school, go right. through the whole thing. All right, well, I... I know had, you don't like to tell this part. I had had the scan, and uh, <coughs> then uh, a couple days later, I was in school in the classroom, and a secretary came down, and she said, you have a phone call from a doctor at Lady Clinic, and he'd like to talk with you. 
So I said, okay. So I wheeled down to the uh, office and I pick up the phone and the doctor said, I have some bad news for you. He said, um, the scan that we did has shown some tumors that have developed mm -hmm. in other parts of your body. He said, so it looked Behind like, your eye, right? Uh, not at that point, okay. but it, it was there, but it didn't show up for another week or so. But he said, I have um, at least 13 tumors. Mm -hmm. And he said, I need to have you and your wife here tomorrow. We need to talk about what we're going to do. Uh, I, I was a basket case. Oh. Uh, could not believe it because I didn't. You thought you were on the road to recovery. Yeah, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, bang. Um, mm -hmm. Didn't you say one time that that pain in your side? You thought maybe you had worked out too hard and cracked the rib or strained the rib. Yeah, I had a I had a pain in my side. I thought I'd hurt that in my physical therapy, but I actually had a tumor there, and it had gone through the tumor had gone through a part of my rib, and the rib was actually cracked. Oh. And uh, I I went home. Uh, I was going home that day, and uh, I had told my wife, I said, you know, if this gets any worse than it's already been, I said, I don't think I'm going to, uh, I'm going to continue uh, living. And uh, she just looked at me and said, what does that mean? And I said, I don't think I can go through this. I've had enough. Well, when that, that w happened, when I found out I was driving my car. I was able to move my. This is up. after you got the call. Yeah, after from I the got doctor, the call, and at, I, the, at the end of the school day. Yeah, you know, and I had a couple of teachers help me out into the car, and I had a plan uh, that I would drive my car off the 95 bridge that crosses the Merrimack River if if something like this happened. That was my plan. So I had a little Nissan uh, station wagon that was a little four-cylinder car. And when I left the school parking lot that day, I had every intention of killing myself. I drove out of the parking lot. Mm -hmm. I started to cry. And I was driving down 95, headed north towards home. And I stepped on the accelerator, and I had the car going about 75 miles an hour, maybe close to 80. That was about as fast as that little tag would go. And I was coming to the bridge that uh, went over the Merrimack River. And as I get, got closer, there was a place to the right of where the fencing came down. They didn't have it all barricaded as they do today. There was a spot that you could go mm -hmm. off the side. I had seen that, and that's how I thought about it. And I looked in a rearview mirror, and there was this trailer truck coming up on my left side. And he was doing a whole lot faster than I was. And he came by me, and he was really, really going, and he pulled right in front of me. And um, I put my brake on, and all of a sudden, I had gone by the end of that, that point where I could have gone off the bridge. I, I wasn't watching what I was doing, because I saw this truck coming. I don't know who sent that truck, but it saved my life. Um, I went home. I had no alternative B. I was caught in the traffic, and I kept right on going. And when I got home, um, I told my wife what had happened, and she said to me, I think I can say this, you bastard, if you had killed yourself, I would have never forgotten, forgiven you, mm -hmm. to leave me with the kids, she said, and not try to fight this thing. And and she said the magic word. Yeah. What was my magic word? W. E. Yeah. We, we, we had to... Yeah, that was tough. That was tough. And I, I she went said, we'll get through this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Not you'll get through this. Yeah. But we'll get through this. So you knew you weren't alone. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's right. And I, she, you know, I <coughs> give her all the credit because all the physical therapy and stuff she did with me, but, and just kept me going through the whole thing. Um, I had to go. Uh, the next day I went down to Leahy. We had the, um, we had, to talk with a doctor, and he said I needed to go through chemotherapy, three months, uh, six months worth of it, every other month. And I had to stay in the hospital for five days while I had the chemotherapy, because it was a very uh, toxic substance and could damage my kidneys and all that kind of thing. I went through it all. Um, he said, you can wait a few months. You've got some time. But he, I said, no, let's go for it. And I started right off. 
So I had the chemotherapy o over a period of the, s of the uh, six months, every other, every other uh, month, um, with shots in between. And I recovered. Um, I, today I have, uh, it isn't all perfect, like I have very little feeling in my right leg. It's like it's been asleep for 33 years, it's numb. My foot's numb, I can sense pressure, but I can't feel detail under it, so I have to be careful not to trip on things. Um, and I have some bladder issues that related from this. Uh, I also, as a result of the radiation treatments that I had, uh, I had a heart attack in, in 2001, two days before 9-11 uh, occurred, and I had to have a quadruple bypass operation. And that was all because the scar tissue that had built up in my heart from the radiation treatment. A lot of people don't realize that that can be a side effect. It took it, what, 28 years or so before that happened, but 20 years. John, I know that was a hard story to tell. I just want you to relax a few minutes. Yeah. Pamela's going to do the grief segment. And Lee, if you have any questions when we come back. All right. As people can see, hearing John today and his story, the loss of health, the loss of a life, potential life, is, is as grief-stricken as any kind of loss we have. People think it's always death, but it is not. And, in, and this was a perfect example for John to tell his story and how people can grieve in many different ways, because losses come in many forms, many shapes, um, and we have no idea how that impacts us. And it can be years later, it, it, it can be the residue grief that comes in years later when it's affecting us. But in that perspective, you know, be aware how important that is to honor those feelings whenever you can, because they will trigger when you least expect it. All right? And that's the important thing. So. Thank you, Pam. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a question for John? Uh -huh. I guess I kind of asked this a little bit before we went on air. Um, I guess I'm interested mostly, John, in how this changed your approach to towards your life and you know the people around you. Well, um, you can't because you know, you know it, it seems terrible, but there's some there's, gifts. There are. There, mm -hmm. there are. That's 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 right. That's right, Lee. Um, this program is uh, one of the gifts in getting to know you people. Um, I have uh, f my whole perspective, being paraplegic for those 14 months and being wheeled into uh, a mall and having a, sec having a waitress come to a restaurant, to a table at a restaurant, with my wife sitting there and asking my wife what I would like to eat <laughs> when I was <laughs> totally capable of saying that myself. Uh, but I, I have such an empathy for mm -hmm. people living with disability because of that. Uh, even going back to school, I, there were children in school that had uh, learning disabilities, severe learning disabilities. I looked at with a whole different, uh, you know, look on life. Really, um, is it fair to say it made you a better human being? I, I think it did. I think mm -hmm. it did. And uh, this, to this day, I mean, this program. Uh, that was the reason. You, that's, you alluded to that at the beginning when I started talking about this. Uh, this program was a way for me to give back a little bit, mm -hmm. I felt, by providing a, an outlet for uh, a program that would touch the demographic of people that are living with disabilities that media really never does, not the mass media. Uh, it's a group of people that are out there who have a tough life and have such courage, and yet they're pretty much overlooked. Uh, a lot, and I felt this was one way of getting this story and having it seven years and having it continue here on uh, Portsmouth Public Media TV is it's heartwarming for me. I'm so glad that you guys are, are doing this. Mm -hmm. No, really. <coughs> when we uh, decided to move over from radio, you know, I, I we met with the people here and just wanted them to know that we don't really have any crying need to to see our faces on television or be on television. That's not our motivation, you know. We don't know. for that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but 
but it really has no part of our being here. But if someone says, well, I'm thinking about giving up, I got a pretty uh, tough challenge ahead of me. Because I, and then they hear your story, John, because I, I don't think it gets tougher than that. Yeah. I mean, this is a brutal story. It's brutal. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it was, and I, you know, having, I guess I never expected, uh, you, you mentioned about weight. Well, I, at one point in my life, I weighed 320, and I'm, I'm no skinny now, but I lost a lot of weight from that. But I, I, I had a heart attack mowing my lawn, and I couldn't believe it, because I, my cholesterol was fairly normal. And when I found out it was all scar tissue, and they couldn't mm -hmm. do anything with a stent, they had to do the quadruple bypass. And then... Um, about seven years ago, I started having some problems with AFib, and uh, go through that it, because people out there they may recognize these symptoms. So be really specific well, about this. Well, you know, that's atrial fibrillation is when your heart just begins beating <coughs> rapidly or irregularly uh, without any control. It'll just take off, or it'll it'll beat, it'll pause for a few seconds, and it'll beat fast a minute, and then it'll pause and you feel like something is moving around in your chest, like it's uh, uh, some sort of an alien in there. It's just really strange. Uh, but it can cause shortness of breath, and uh, it's, it's, it's panicky. It's a panicky thing to have happen, depending on how much it is, how, how difficult it is, or how, st how strong and how fast it's repeated. But I went to the doctor immediately. I've been watched anyway since the heart uh, operation. Turns out that um, I now have an aortic and a mitral valve that are both scar tissue growing on those, and the blood flows down about 40% or 30%. When it gets to 40, I'm going to need a valve transplant, double valve transplant. Mm -hmm. So um, that's where we're looking at now. <laughs> and the crew <laughs> here at uh, PPM TV is uh, graciously agreed to film your operation live that's at the right. hospital. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. The sterilized cameras, of yes. course. Yes. 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 Thank you guys for doing <laughs> that. It means a lot. Yes. Yes. But, uh, you know, I, the, the thing is, you know, that I've been assured that that's fairly normal operation. Uh, we'll, we'll see. Hopefully it's not. <laughs> How has it changed your... Do you... I mean, I think everybody fears death somewhat. Do you... Does it... Have you lost that sting of uh -huh. that, or is that still a major worry, or how let, do you look at life and death? Like let, me, let me say this, Ronnie. I, four years ago, uh, it, was, it will be four years ago this coming April, I guess, Dr. Fager, who was that man that operated on me, when I was in Leahy Clinic, he came up to me. He, had a, he was a, a doctor that I, like, I've never met before or since. Very, he would come and he'd, he'd hold your hand, he'd put his arm around you, he'd sit on the bed, talk with you. And he got, he got cancer of the bladder when I was in the hospital. Oh. And he actually came to my room and sat on the bed and he said, I can have a lot of empathy. I've just been diagnosed with bladder cancer and I'm going to have to be leaving your you know, care for a while. I'm going to put oh. you in the hands of another doctor. Mm. Well, Dr. Fager was, became a friend and he, he recovered from the cancer uh, treatment. And I, I went to him many more times over the years. Uh, he passed away four years ago. He was in his <coughs> 90s. Wow. And I sent him a, every Christmas, I sent him a, a note, a thank you note. And uh, it was a foundation that I contributed a little bit of money to. Not a lot, but I did something. His son, who I believe his name is Jeff Fager, he was the producer of uh, 60 Minutes on CBS News. When his father died, um, I got a phone call, and it was, he said, my name is Jeff Fager, and I am Dr. Fager's son. He said, I am looking through his, his uh, desk, and I found uh, an album, and it has cards in there, and there's a lot of them from you. He yeah. saved them. He saved them. Oh. And he said, I'm asking you to speak at his memorial service on behalf of the 6,000 patients that he treated over, this, over a 50 year career. And so I went to Leahy Clinic and before an audience of about three or four hundred people, I got up and I talked for about ten minutes about Dr. Fager. And uh, I had doctors stand up and applaud and they come up to me and I, I, I just, it was another way of giving back to a man who I felt was just a remarkable, remarkable man and surgeon. 
And uh, to have that son ask me to do that for his father was mm -hmm. amazing because he, he had 6,000 patients. Uh, but he picked you. Uh, he picked me because uh -huh. I, of the notes I wrote, I, I guess. But I, I sure, I almost fell over. The sad part of that was they videotaped the entire thing and Leahy organization hired a videotaping crew, professional crew from uh, Boston. They didn't want their own in people to handle it, I guess. Something happened and it, not, none of the tape came out and uh, it, it was ruined. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jeff Fager called me and he said, I'm so sorry. He said, but could I have a copy of what you read? Did you, you know, the thing that you did, the speech? So I sent him that. And, but when I was in at Leahy that day, I'm sitting in this, the room where they had a big reception afterwards and I'm walking, watching these people go by and one of them looked awfully familiar with Scott Pelley who does the evening news now on, C on CBS. There were all these people from CBS. I never connected Jeff <laughs> Fager to the CBS uh, thing. So he was, a, that was, wow. that was quite an honor for me. So there's been a lot. When you ask about life experiences and has it changed my life, oh yes, yeah. it has. And yeah. you know, those are the parts to me, you know, given what I've been through with my stroke, that you know, there are some gifts if you look at the direction your life goes after something fairly traumatic happens. And, you know, most people don't get kind of underneath that first traumatic part and realize that. They kind of get scared away a little bit. So it is reaffirming, I guess, to me to have somebody that has some of the same experiences right. that I've had that, you know, it's the reason I'm on the show too. I mean, I was the first guest. You know, I was on the other side initially. That's right. And so I'm kind of new to this. <laughs> Can I tell you one f funny thing that actually sure. happened? Sure. We like funny things. Funny things. <laughs> My father, who uh, he passed away at 90, but when he was he was in his 70s when I was sick. Uh, he would, my wife would take me to the uh, rehab center here in Portsmouth where, they, where the pool is, down near the high school. That's, that's oh, where yeah, I used to go sure. into the, for the pool. And he would take me two days a week and my wife would take me two days a week. Uh, she was working part time and so she would, you know, we'd alternate. But he would take me and uh, there was a long ramp going down into the pool. And my father, I was in the wheelchair, and he was taking me down the ramp. And this was one, it was a day like in August of like 1984. And it was hot and humid, and, and the pool was quite, the air inside was stuffy. And we're going down the ramp. There's like 40 people in the pool. A lot of them were people under rehabilitation. I had a life jacket on. And we're going down the pool, down the ramp. And all of a sudden, I'm going faster and faster and faster. <laughs> and I'm going, I'm really going down the pool fast, and I hear, Oh, damn. And I turned around and looked at my father. That's not what you want to hear. <laughs> he was sitting down on, in the water. He slipped and fell, and he lost oh. the wheelchair. Oh. Oh, I no. hit that water about 40 miles an hour. <laughs> when I hit the water, the water stopped the wheelchair, and I just went forward right into the water, the oh, somersault. Right into the, and all the water went up on the, got everybody wet on the end of the pool. <laughs> and when I came up, I just started laughing, and everybody else did too, but it was... It, I mean, maybe it doesn't sound funny, but it was funny. Did, it, did they give you a score on it? Uh, <laughs> no. Sounds like one of those things you should... Oh, okay, that's an eight. Where they hold up like... Yeah, eight, yeah, eight, yeah. That's right. eight. I'll give him an eight, eight on that one. That's right. <laughs> wow. Oh, that was funny. Oh, Poor guy. He, uh, yeah, he was so worried he let go of me, but he couldn't catch up. What, um, I, what I want to get in here is that I didn't know the whole part about going down the highway and planning to go into the river. And oh, I touched my thing here. Well, all right, sue me. <laughs> so, uh, and and then when we were, after a while of interviewing people, I, I kind of recognized a, a trend, or not a trend, but a pattern, that even young people faced with severe disabilities had made attempts at suicide. And so we decided, uh, and I don't know why no one stopped us on this one either, that we were going to make a film on suicide. I remember going to work and <clears throat> saying, well, what do you want to do with the show, Ronnie? He says, one of the things I really want to do is because I keep, keep coming up. Mm -hmm. People want to giving up and, and actually made attempts at suicide. 
So I said, I want to do a film on that. So she had this young friend, and she says, well, I'll, I'll send somebody over. I had no idea about uh, professional filming or anything like that. And this young man came over, and during the course of making this film there, which we got some incredible footage, and we actually produced the film, that's when I found out about your own story. We were making this film, and then that's when you, you said, Ronnie, this, this is my story. And Pamela, uh, who's on the film, yeah, we were called, you, called you interviewed him. Yeah, I did, yeah. So that is all captured on film. Mm -hmm. and yeah. So, and um, what I want to do now is, uh, I, I want to, the quality's not great, especially in the opening, so I really want to uh, um, redo that. Mm -hmm. And uh, maybe that's possible here, because it's really powerful stuff, mm -hmm. what we've got there. Mm -hmm. yeah. And because if you don't give up, people can say, well, life is tough, I gotta give up. You're not gonna hear mm -hmm. a story like this that not once but twice did you get pulled back from from the grave. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you still didn't give up. Well, the, the thing that I thought about, and again, it addresses what Lee just mentioned. If I had gone off that bridge, mm -hmm. I was 35 years old at the time. I've had, I'm, I'm almost 70 now, and I've had 35 years of life. I've seen my kids grow up. I've mm -hmm. seen the grandchildren born. Uh, you know, I was able to be with my parents to the end of their life. I had all these things, and I, at the time, I was hoping I'd live long enough to get the kids through high school. You know, I thought maybe if I could live long enough to be there, see them 18, even that was a long time. Uh, for at that time, it seemed like nine, it was nine years or so. So, if I had gone off that bridge, I never, if, never would have known, of course, that all this would have, could have happened. And so it makes me realize that if when you're down at your lowest moment, if you do commit suicide, it's done. It's over. I know, mm -hmm. I know that seems like, uh, yeah, that's common sense, but you don't think about that. Mm -hmm. When you think you're going to do it, you're, mm -hmm. you're kind of um, just intent on solving your own misery, your own mm -hmm. problem. You don't think about everybody else and what ifs. It's, mm -hmm. This is the way to get out of it now. You're not thinking about what it would do to Melanie and the girls? No, unfortunately you don't. Yeah. And that's, that's the hard part. But I having, having to go through the experience of, of not having it happen, and again, that truck being there was the reason. Mm -hmm. um, I, I've been blessed, yeah. you know, really, Absolutely. totally. Because it's not a situation where you're saying, because you still have a lot of issues, medical issues. Yeah. But, but even with your medical issues and not having the feeling in a leg and stuff like that, even at 70, life is still precious and worth living. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And, and uh, you know, being at the, at the station for 13 years and, and, and coming here, working here, hopefully, uh, we're... Uh, it's exciting, and as uh, long as I can do it, I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> That's our goal. I mean, I mean, who I don't, we'll never know. Even at the seven years of the radio show, you never know uh, who's out there. And maybe it's yeah. just one sentence or one mm -hmm. word mm -hmm. that, can sh that can help someone change their lives. Nice. And that's all we're, that's all we're trying to do. We don't have any grand aspirations about making it to Hollywood or whatever. I mean, we don't care about that crap, you know. But if there's, if we can help, if there's anybody out there, yeah. just don't give up. Don't give up. You're stronger than you think. If you rely on your strength instead of relying on your weakness, you'll make it. And, and just think about all the people that will help you if you reach out to them. Don't isolate. Reach out to the people mm -hmm. around you. If you're feeling that way, put words to it. Express yourself. Let them know that this is a bad time for you. Absolutely. It's not strength to keep it all bottled in. Mm -hmm. that's, that's John Wayne BS. Mm -hmm. Although I like John Wayne. I like his <laughs> movies. But hey, Pilgrim. It, yeah, Pilgrim. But it's not strength yeah. to keep yeah. it in and keep it to yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's well, a lot of things that should die, not you. But that kind of thinking should die. Mm 
Mm -hmm. That is strength to keep yeah. not share what you're going through with people in your life, your families, and things like that. Yeah. They they need to know. They need to know if you're having a rough time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Any thoughts? Many thoughts. I you know I just keep I your voice up a little bit, Bunny. I commend I commend John so much for coming mm -hmm. and sharing that because of what he's gone through and he's so open to be able to do all that uh, and and help others with that because there's that sense of hope and that divine intervention with that truck that came in mm -hmm. you know it wasn't your call it wasn't your it wasn't you couldn't do it anyway right. you know someone came in you know and how many times does that happen and the things that you yeah. can say to somebody that nobody else can say yeah. Lee could say them too. But if you say to somebody, don't give up, mm -hmm. they're going to say, well, who the hell are you to tell me not to give up? Exactly. You, and then you, you, you have the, you've earned the right to tell somebody, don't right. give up. That's right. Like Lee has. Right. Absolutely. Well, I, it, it's important, I guess, is the reason I brought it up. And not just for John or just for me, but for the people around you. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, those are the, that's the people that matters for mm -hmm. most. The final thought is, you're, you're, until we did the suicide film, your daughters didn't know this story, right? You remember me telling you? Right, right, that? right that, yeah, that's right. Wow. You uh, got about a minute. What was their reaction when they found out about this? Well, uh, they, of course, they didn't remember it. They didn't remember it. Five and one. Yeah, five well, we had a little one. She didn't remember. They, the thing they liked most was riding in the hospital bed going up and down, and I gave them a lot of trips on that. But, uh, no, they didn't remember it. Well, they just, um, they, they love me a whole lot. And, uh, <laughs> you know, we're, we're a very close family, and it's pretty nice when you're, 44-year-old daughter comes over and hugs you and says, I love you, Daddy, you know, uh, yeah. and the other one, too. So that's worth everything, you that's know. Right. So. That's right. That's right. And that's something, I love you, Daddy, you would never hurt. That's right. That's right. That's right. You, can't, got, you can't, as a father, a too. I as love a father grandpa. of two girls, and uh, <laughs> you're, you're a mother, and Lee's a father. You can't get enough of those, that's I right. love you, Dad, or I love you, Mom. No. Lee, the, what do we, oh, I'm sorry, buddy. Or the, the one that I liked from my daughter was, you know, Dad, you were right. <laughs> yeah, that one, treasure that one. That one, <laughs> that one I, yeah, I should have taped that one. <laughs> what do we say at the end of the show, Lee? Remember, it's what you can do, not what you can't. Okay, thank okay. you, everybody. Thank, thank you. See me beautiful, look for the best in me. It's what I really am and all I want to be. It may take some time, it may be hard to find, but see me beautiful. Don't Diss My Ability has been made possible through the generous support of Full Circle Community Thrift Store, helping individuals or families living with cancer. Our goal is to help alleviate the stresses of daily financial obligations during this time by providing financial assistance to those in need. Full Circle Community Thrift Store. Living Innovations, providing support for people with developmental disabilities to have a good life at home and in the community. Services include Community Connections, which facilitates employment, skill development, and community integration to maximize each individual's well-being and independence. For more information or to learn about job opportunities for compassionate people wishing to do meaningful work, visit livinginnovations.com. Natural Care Wellness Center has been serving the New Hampshire and Maine seacoast for 18 years. Our goal is to encourage a healthy lifestyle through education, wellness choices, and hands-on healing. Natural Care Wellness Center, offering gentle force chiropractic, family and child wellness, chiropractic acupuncture, holistic nutrition, nutrition response testing, a decompression table, therapeutic exercise, whole food supplements, neuro-emotional techniques and massage therapy and by One Sky Community Services for over 30 years One Sky has taken great pride in overcaring for those with developmental disabilities and acquired brain disorders dedicated to every individual it serves giving them full comprehensive support and services essential to fulfilling the personal and professional potential and becoming a successful member of their community serving 24 seacoast communities Call 
6111 for further information. And by TMS Architects, New England Design Redefined.